Hi, my name is Jessica Linehan. I'm the Curator of Collections and Exhibits at the Arts and Science Center for Southeast Arkansas, located in Pine Bluff. This is our Inside the Arts series, where we go behind the scenes of what's happening at the Arts and Science Center. Today, my guest is the artist Jacob Rowan. Jacob is one of the artists featured in the Biennial Rosenzweig Juried Exhibition, which is up now in our galleries. Jacob, it's nice to speak with you today. Good to be here. Yeah, so to start, tell us about your background. Where are you from? What's your educational background? Yeah, um, so I grew up a military kid. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force, and so we moved around a whole lot. Um, I think I've lived in like nine different places. I uh, moved to Germany for a while, so overseas, and then a bunch of different states, Idaho, California, Maryland. Um, but came time to, to choose a college, uh, and I ended up in Jackson, Mississippi at Bellhaven University, um, just because they had a really great art program. I was really drawn to that. And so that's where I got my undergraduate degree. Um, and then I started teaching at a um, college prep school here, Jackson Academy. Um, and then while I was doing that, I started working on my master's in a low residency program. So I would go every summer for four summers to Baltimore. Uh, and I was working uh, at the Maryland Institute College of Art on that MFA degree. So I finished that back in, because it would have been 2019, summer of 2019. Um, so got my MFA. And then shortly after that, ended up getting a job back at Bellhaven University. So it's kind of cool to be back where I was trained trying to help the next generation. All right, so for those who are not familiar with your work as a whole, you often talk about your work spawning from your interest in the tale of the Tower of Babel. So can you talk about how that's guided you and um, how that kind of intersects with your other inspirations? Yeah, I like the Tower of Babel as kind of a reference point because I think it's a story a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and even if you're not, you can look it up and it's, you know, it'll take you a minute to read. It's very short. Um, but this sort of imagery of, um, so in the Bible, of, it's almost, it feels like a very science fiction story to me almost. There's this new technology of bricks that these people have. Um, they get together and they're like, hey, let's sort of build a name for ourselves. Let's transcend our limits. Let's build this, you know, space elevator up to heaven. Um, so that we don't have to wait around for God to show up. Um, and so they they build it, and then God comes down and says, nope, confuses their language. Um, and so there's a whole lot going on there. Um, I feel like it touches on questions about technology. Um, it has a lot to do with language, obviously, and kind of the, the complicated nature of communication. Uh, I think growing up in several countries kind of contributed to that interest of how does your culture and your language shape the way that, that you approach the world? Um, so it just kind of became this story that just seemed to sit at this intersection of, of all the stuff that I was interested in. And so I think that's what attracted it, attracted me to it at first. Um, and then the kind of things I like to draw were very geometric and inspired by technology. And uh, undergrad, I was doing a lot of drawings of like circuit boards, and they look kind of like cities from above, but they were also technology, um, lots of like tower shapes. And so it kind of just seemed like a good fit. Um, started drawing all these towers and this kind of stark horizon line with a single, you know, tower form rising from it. Um, so that's kind of how it, how it started, I think. How does science fiction and architecture come into play with that? should probably think of like a cooler artsy answer. The real reason is I was just obsessed with Star Wars and science fiction as a kid. Um, I don't really remember anything from like middle school or high school other than the just absurd number of Star Wars novels that I read in my free time. So I think that's kind of seeped into me. Um, so that's kind of the starting obsession, I guess. Um, but as I, as I got a little bit older uh, and that love of science fiction stayed with me, I think it's because science fiction makes you think in a lot of ways. Like it's cool and for spaceships and all that stuff, which is awesome. But anytime you tell a story about the future, I think you're automatically raising all these kind of interesting philosophical questions about how we live, how would we get there if, if that is the future? What could we do to avoid that? Um, so to me, science fiction is a good kind of inspiration point 
uh, because it is so thought provoking and touches on so many kind of bigger questions. Uh, and then architecture, I guess, is part of it is just like a visual interest. Like I just, I love buildings. I love organization. I love structure. Um, and so like architectural drawings have been a thing that I've looked at a lot. Just, there's just something They're about They're very that. neat and orderly yeah. in a way that your work is also neat and orderly. Yeah. It's a very, it's like an organized chaos. Yeah. And yeah, and those architectural drawings are kind of making sense of the chaos of real life. Like when you're making a building, you've got, well, maybe all the lumber is a little bit warped or some of the bricks are chipped or you have this weird elevation thing or in Mississippi, we, or in Jackson specifically, we have this Yazoo clay that makes the roads here just absolutely terrible. So you're like dealing with all this chaos of real life. But at first there's this kind of ideal drawing where you've, You've come up with your plan, it's perfect. Everything's laid out and kind of abstracted into this plan. But then you have to do something with that plan. And that's where it gets a little bit, a little bit messy. Yeah. When your work is installed in those configurations, they look like the plans of like a mad genius, the way that they are like overlapping yeah. and they're sharing information between each other. And it looks like something that somebody is like totally understood and if you could just like unlock that code you would know the exact thing that they know yeah. you know especially when you start incorporating like string into it I think of those like planning boards where it's like well this is clearly connected to this and so it's like I feel like it's like just right on the edge of providing us with a key yeah one of the kind of when I was thinking through how to use these panels one of the kind of images that I was looking at was like in a detective show and there's the wall of clues. Yeah, that's like, I'm trying to figure something out and I, I think I've got it, but there's like some piece that's missing. I feel like that when I'm working. I don't feel like I'm the genius that's got it all worked out. It's more like I'm a detective and I feel like I see something and I'm trying to figure out what that, you know, maybe that order is underneath all this. And I can't quite get it to fit. And so I put new panels up or I connect different things. It's more That's, of a, like a work in progress rather than yeah. like, I figured it out. Here it is. Yes, exactly. So are there any artists in other disciplines even that you're inspired by? Yeah. Um, in visual art, Julia Maritou is a contemporary artist. I totally I see that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that same sense of there's this structure and order, but then the kind of chaos of the hand-drawn marks on top of the more like architectural work. Um, so she's kind of like the immediate artist that I always mention, um, something I would aspire to be like with her work. What's interesting is the scale is so different, mm -hmm. right? Hers are these like enormous pieces that are like confronting you and right. then yours are, they feel more intimate. Yeah, I've thought about that before. I, my initial thought was, oh, well, she can do that because she's got studio assistants and a giant like cathedral in Berlin that you know she can make work in or San Francisco, whatever it is. But um, I, I mentioned that to a mentor at one point. I was like, oh, if I had like a big studio, I could work like that. And he's like, would you really? That's like, the, exactly. That's the question. Would you? Yeah. I don't think so. I think if I'm honest with myself, there's something about that kind of desk sized work. Um, the largest I've ever gone has been four by two feet. And I've only done that once. I generally work on like a six by six all the way up to about two feet by one foot, which is what the, the piece that you guys have is. And there is something about that, that scale that's it's practical. You know, I, I can't just make art all the time. So this thing that I can sort of put on a desk or put away when I don't have time um, is, is nice. Conceptually, I think it, it does fit more with this idea of I'm trying to figure something out. You know, to work on a, you know, 16 foot canvas kind of implies I know what's going on, right? I have a, here's something you need to pay attention to. Right, so the piece that we bought um, is titled Edificial Epistemologies. And it's taken from this larger configuration. 
So yeah. by showing it in the show, you know, it's it's not grouped with all its friends. Yeah. And so for you, ideally, would the pieces kind of live together or do you think that they communicate the same when they're on their own? I hope that they communicate something along the same lines on their own. Um, I think I'm still trying to figure that out as I work. Um, ideally, there would be at least a few of them together. Um, I don't, it's not something where they all need to be together. I don't think I've ever actually shown all of them at once. I've come close twice, but there's always some that aren't finished or as soon as I have a show, I'm making new ones. And the idea is that it is constantly evolving. Like I can sell one or give one away or add two more or um, put them in a different configuration and a new gallery that has a different kind of shaped wall. <laughs> But I hope that that sense of like constructing and um, like piecing something together is present even at that small scale of a single piece. It's kind of like, um, you know, there's this idea, idea in like medieval theology and alchemy that like as above, so below, like at even the smallest level, that big macro cosmic order is still the same when you take just like a tiny piece of it like people the way the human body works is like a picture of the cosmos kind of thing so it's like my hope that like every little piece is like a microcosm of the big kind of ongoing unfinished piece but yeah let's break it down for the audience like so edificial epistemologies yeah so an edifice it's a word I love because it kind of has this double meaning. It can be both like a, a big, complex, imposing structure. So like a skyscraper is an edifice, uh, you know, ziggurat or a pyramid is kind of an edifice. But it's also used to mean like a set of ideas or beliefs. So you could talk about like the edifice of Christianity or the edifice of modernism. Like it's uh, the sort of big, complex belief system. And so it has that, that double meaning. Um, and then epistemology is just a theory of knowledge. And so for me, that kind of big architectural structure is how I think knowledge works. Like I think that as human beings, we have this scaffold of sort of ideas. Maybe it's how we were raised. Maybe it's something genetic. I don't know where it comes from, but we have this sort of initial support structure and as we move through life and get an education and have all the experiences that we've had, like things stick or make sense because they fit that structure. But that structure is always changing a little bit. Like maybe you were raised in one faith and you, you leave that at some point, or maybe you always assume this is the way the world works, but then you get enough information. You kind of ignored it at first because it didn't really fit with that system. But eventually there's too much. You have to accept, oh, okay, maybe that is true. And you have to kind of rebuild that structure a little bit. Um, and so architecture is, is kind of like a, just a metaphor for that. It's just, uh, I'm not interested in architecture, like how it works, the experience of living in a building, that kind of stuff. It's more like a picture or a metaphor for how I think our minds assemble information, if that makes sense. So it seems like, your pieces are more about the process of attempting to derive meaning more yeah. so than that and there is an actual literal meaning awaiting the viewer yeah i mean i i believe truth is a thing i think we can know things but we're also subjective we filter everything through our experiences through things we've heard, you know, the order that you learn something matters, like what you learn first affect what you learn next. So I, I think it's just like an interest in all of that, that complexity. So you started out drawing these things, but now you've recently started incorporating a drawing machine into your process. So can you kind of explain how that works and the purpose of it? When I started at Bellhaven, they had just gotten this new digital fabrication lab that had all these like 3D printers, uh, resin printer, virtual reality headsets, the Glowforge. 
Um, and this little machine called an AxiDraw, which is just a plotter or a drawing machine. Uh, and it's very simple. It's just a, a basically like a little robot arm that has an X and a Y axis. And so any kind of drawing you do that's a vector drawing, so anything that's made in like Adobe Illustrator, uh, it will recreate that. So it holds whatever pen you want um, and whatever kind of paper you want, and it'll draw that, that those lines for you. Um, and I was like, oh, that's just super interesting. I've always not really cared about like my hand being in a drawing, like the idea of like me kind of expressing myself through the way I draw or something. I wasn't super interested in that. It was more like this kind of architectural drawings that we talked about. So I used rulers a lot anyway and templates and I liked that really clean line, but I didn't like working digitally because I, I just, there was something about the material of ink on paper that I liked, even though I didn't necessarily care about seeing you know my hand shake or whatever. Um, and so I was like, oh, this might be something interesting to play with. And so I experimented, played around with it a lot. Um, and I kind of joke now, it's like my little robot studio assistant because it really speeds up my process. So I use it for kind of two different things most of the time. Uh, one is I am kind of building a library of, of images or motifs. Um, so things that I'm interested in, I can use over and over in different panels. Um, so like a drawing of this sort of cathedral tower type shape. I can use that in multiple ways. I can scale it up, I can reverse it, I can draw it in different colored ink. And so rather than having to draw it every time, I have a machine that will do it for me. So I've used it for that a lot. And then the other thing that I've most recently been using it for is to create I call it like a chaos field or complexity field. I'll give it like a pattern to draw and have it start and then I'll just interrupt it or move it. I just sort of layer all of these uh, drawings on top of each other and like ballpoint pen so it's fairly light. And then once I have that complexity, then I go in and start imposing more structure to it. I kind of find usually architectural forms and so go in by hand and like pull things out. Um, and then I might go in again with the axi draw. So it's this kind of layering process that I use. Yeah. It's interesting that you incorporated more structure, right? Mm -hmm. It's very precise. And then you immediately introduced chaos. It's also kind of weird because I, I use the machine to make the chaos and I put the order in. So like, there's some where I've had the computer kind of randomly scattered, just like little hatched marks. Uh, and I, cause I'm interested in having an element of chaos. Like that's part of our, our complexity. I don't know if it's chaotic, but you know, like Julia Merritt too, it's like, I really love those hand-drawn chaotic marks. Every time I've tried to do that, I'm really unsatisfied with it. Uh, it's not until I had a computer kind of make something truly random that I felt, oh yeah, that's that's what I want. So the computer does all the the chaosy things, and then I go in and sort of impose a, an order to it again. Do you have anything else that you're looking to start incorporating into these pieces? Like, has that inspired you in a way to further tweak how this process goes? I, it's still at a pretty early stage. So I feel like I'm just now starting to figure out uh, how to incorporate this process. Um, but there's a few other tools that use a, a sort of similar, like it can turn a vector um, into something in the real world. So like vinyl cutters um, are interesting. I wanna maybe experiment with that to work a little bit bigger. Um, a laser cutter will do the same thing. You can you, you can cut things out with a laser cutter, but you can also lower the power and just have it sort of engrave designs. So I feel like there's a lot more material things I could do rather than just, it's always a pen and it's always on paper. Um, ways to get a little more kind of sculptural with it, I guess. Not really making sculpture, but a little more material, a wider range of approaches within one, one panel. So I'm kind of excited to see what I can do with that. You know, working on, on those, those wood panels like that, I do really like it 
because it's an object, um, it holds up a little bit better, but it's also, it's like a, a thing, it's a constructed thing. It's plywood, which is a construction material. I'm building this drawing. It's not just flat paper that I then have to go put in a frame. It kind of has its own own life. And I've, I do really like layering, um, like in, in the piece that you guys have, there's some like transparent paper that you can see the drawing through. Um, I would like to do more of that or get back to that. I did a lot of that a while ago. Um, but this idea of if you're finding something, you're making connections this way, but you're also kind of, there's like an archeological element to it as well. You're like digging down to something. I've like cut directly into the panels before so you can see you know, the, the layers to the plywood. Um, yeah. So as a teacher of art, what are some guiding principles that you think are the most important for artists to learn as they start out? I think the single like word that I probably use the most is process. Um, I think a lot of, especially young artists have this idea that making art is about having this really good idea and you just make it. And then that's, that's the artwork. And it's like almost all of the time, that is not how art gets made. You have a, an interest maybe or a starting idea, but then you make something and then you make another thing and you make another thing. And maybe that 10th thing is the one that you show people. Um, there's that element of practice that we have in theater and music and all these other arts, but in visual art, people want to come and just sit down and oh yeah I made this thing and now it's done and it's finished and I'm going to move on to my next idea whereas I think it's it's much more a, a process of investigation of experimentation of making mistakes of practicing things of tr like iterating is kind of the design word for it um, so I think the core of how I approach teaching students to make art is based around that idea of, of process and then I guess also, you know, artists see the world, even if you're not making art that's just directly painting or drawing what you see, visual art still is very much about perception and perceiving the world. And so to be an artist, you have to practice that. That's a skill that you develop. Um, I happen to think the best way to do that is to keep a sketchbook where you're drawing constantly, sketching constantly, writing ideas down, brainstorming, making up things. Uh, but you're kind of always engaged in that process of looking, responding. Um, I think that's really the, the core of what art is. And anyone can do that, no matter how much education you have. Um, that starts there. That ties into the next question I had, which is what would you tell someone interested in becoming an artist? All of that, <laughs> I would say again. And then I would encourage them that it, it is a viable like career path or life path. Um, it's not the most lucrative career path, but it's not, I think there's kind of a negative stereotype of all artists are poor or you'll just be eating rice and beans for the rest of your life if you go into art. That's just not really true. Um, it's definitely hard. You should want it and be prepared to work and, and make some sacrifices. But there are tons of jobs out there that involve artistic skills. There are tons of ways to connect with an audience and kind of have a freelance or entrepreneurial approach to selling your art. Um, and it's valuable, too, is the other thing. It's, it's, not, the, it's not selfish to pursue wanting to bring beautiful, interesting, thought-provoking things into the world. Um, it's, it's part of what makes us human. It seems to be the thing that when a culture is dead and gone, that's what seems to remain. That's what we pay attention to is not what their political leaders were saying. It was what kind of art did they leave behind? What kind of things did they build? Um, so that would be my encouragement is, is don't don't write it off just because it might be a little bit harder than some other career. I like that sentiment because when I, I got my degree in art, it felt like, what are you doing? You, there's so many things you could have done, but 
I'm much happier for it. And, you know, being an art teacher, anytime I meet someone, it seems like, you know, they ask, what do you do? I'm an art teacher. It's like everybody has a story. Oh, my daughter studied art, but I made her do this too, to have like a backup plan. Or, you know, my son was really into art, but I, ended, I kind of pushed him to do this. And, you know, because I didn't want him to be poor. And it's just like, that's so sad. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's really heartbreaking. It's like, yeah. My wife's a musician. I'm an artist. And we're not rich. We can't go to Disney World, you know, which would be fun. But uh, we're happy. We have, we've managed to find jobs in the arts that are fulfilling and rewarding and pay the bills. And um, I just think a lot of people write it off because it's a little bit harder maybe than going down a more established oh yeah if you do this and this and this you get to be a doctor at the end of it i've uh I've talked to several students recently that are close to graduating and, and kind of considering grad school and but still questioning well should i do art or do i need to find something safer um, and one of the things i was trying to encourage them with was you don't have to know like there's no guarantee oh if you do grad school this will happen or this will work out but in a lot of ways, it's, it's like making art. It's a process. You experiment, you fail, you have success. You're kind of crafting your life as you go, which everybody does to a degree. But I think with art, you just have to be a little more intentional about it. But that's okay because you have so much more practice because you do that all the time and you're painting or your photography or whatever it is that, that you do. Um, your life is the same way. It's just, it's a process of discovering the sort of best, best approach or the, the approach that makes you the most happy. Well, Jacob, thank you so much for talking with me today. Jacob's work is currently on view in our Kennedy Gallery as part of the Rosenzweig juried exhibition. It'll be up until October 16th. And then after that, it's going to live with us. Great. <laughs> Have a great day, Jacob. Thank you. You too.